Not in my name. Welcome viewers to another edition of A Muslim's Perspective. Praise belongs to Allah. We praise Him and we ask Him for guidance and forgiveness and we seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evil of our actions. Whom Allah guides, no one can lead Him astray and whom He makes astray, no one can lead Him back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no other deity but Allah by Himself and no associate to Him. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his servant and messenger. Our guest today is Samuel Shropshire. Assalamu alaikum, Samuel. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, please allow me the opportunity to introduce you to our viewers. Uh, Samuel Earl Shropshire is a former pastor. He has spent his entire life working for nonprofit causes. He has worked in the fields of human rights and peacemaking, lobbying the American, Canadian, British governments, and the United Nations for 35 years. He has connections with many pastors, priests, monks, congressmen, and members of parliament, and other government leaders. Samuel is also the founder of the Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation, an international dawah or peace organization. Now viewers, Islam and Muslims are, have a negative image in the hearts and minds of most of our contemporaries. It is easy to point out causes which are within and outside of the faith community. We are sometimes our own worst enemy. Yet there are many, many folks who are adopting the faith and bearing witness that there is no deity deserving of worship except God. And Muhammad is the last messenger. Samuel, can you share with us the backstory of how God guided you to this faith? Well, brother, it's been very interesting since my childhood. People ask me, uh, when did you convert to Islam? And I have to tell them, uh, when I was three years old, my mother used to take me to a Baptist church in Jefferson, Georgia, a very small town. And population was just over 1,000. <laughs> and she would tell me, uh, when I got to the church, Sammy, if you behave, if you sit still and are quiet you're, while the pastor is preaching, then I'll let you go to the library after the church service and you can choose a book. And the book that I chose, a children's book with beautiful color pictures, the book that I chose over and over again was called The God of Ibrahim or Abraham. It was beautiful had full color pictures of camels and men in long white tobes. And my mother would stop in the middle of the story about Abraham and she would say, Sammy, when you're older, you must pray to the God of Ibrahim or Abraham. There's only one God. Now I was taught that by a Christian mother. I was taught that. She sent me off to a Christian boarding school, high school. Then I went to a university, Christian university, college. Then I went to uh, three Christian graduate schools. But all the time I'm thinking God is one. God is one. Um, now, I didn't understand all of this. I was working in human rights for some 35 years since I was 18 years old. I had been uh, traveled all over the world every summer traveling, and I would would um, often, uh, while traveling, I was doing uh, what they called Christian Dawa, or evangelism, but I was arrested in the Soviet Union when I was just 21 years old, hitchhiking all over Europe. That's where I met my wife. She was my interpreter in Czechoslovakia. She helped me in uh, doing underground evangelism. It was a communist country, Czechoslovakia. But all the time I'm thinking God is one. I didn't believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I later, my wife, after we were married, we moved to California. My daughter was born there, then to Washington, D.C., where I was U.S. President of Christian Solidarity International. 
the organization was like a form of, it was a Christian type of Amnesty International. We worked in re religious freedom issues. We sought to get people who were being persecuted because of their religious faith out of prison. So I would organize U.S. congressmen, members of the Canadian Parliament, members of the British Parliament to travel with me. We would travel to, let's say, for example, Romania. I had four congressmen traveling there with me and members of the Parliament, British Parliament. Uh, we would meet with the Ceausescu family. Nikolai Ceausescu was the dictator, communist dictator. Met with his family. And we were successful in getting 156 Christians, Jews, and Muslims out of prison in Romania. It was a great success. Now I'm back in Washington, D.C., and I'm Muslim. I've, uh, I didn't understand what was Islam. I, I later went into politics and after being in Washington and went into politics in Annapolis, Maryland. I was the head of the Democratic Party there. Annapolis is the capital of Maryland. So I was involved in the state government. I was elected to the Annapolis City Council. Later, I ran for mayor of Annapolis. And because of a lot of issues, <laughs> I won't go into it. Politics is dirty business. But I lost that election. I went into a period of depression, mental depression. Oh, how can I lose? How can I lose? But God, after two years of fighting this depression, he sent me to um, Saudi Arabia. A, a brother by the name of, of uh, Safi Kaskas, a Lebanese American, came to me and he said, Get out of this situation. Come with me to Saudi Arabia. Now I'm telling my friends at the U.S. Naval Academy that I'm thinking about moving to Saudi Arabia, and they're coming to me, and they're showing me videos in their mobile phones of Christians being decapitated by Muslim extremists, Al-Qaeda. Now I don't know what to do. I tried to find other work in the United States, but I couldn't find anything. Every door was shut to me except Saudi Arabia. Eventually, I agreed. Uh, it was a difficult time. My house was in foreclosure. You see, when God wants to, to move us somewhere, he'll pull the carpet out from under us and he'll force us to go. It's not a matter of choice. And this was the way it was for me. I went to Saudi Arabia. I'm there with Safi Kaskas working. My work was simply proofreading a new English translation of the Quran. So every night I'm reading Quran, reading Quran, reading Quran. I must have read it 10 times in the first six months. And every writing down questions and every morning meeting with the panel of sheikhs asking questions. Safi answered so many of my questions. I was a new experience for me. I was afraid at first. I would walk down the street to a mini market to get food. And every time somebody passed me on the street, I'd look over my shoulder to make sure they didn't pull out a knife. They weren't ready to cut my throat. No, it was exactly the opposite. It was the Muslims of Saudi Arabia that confirmed to me what was Islam. I'd go to Hyper Panda supermarket and people would see me. I'm dressed in Western clothes and <laughs> they would come up to me and they'd say, where are you from? And I'd eventually say, I'm from the United States. And they would reach out and hug me. And they would say, welcome to Saudi Arabia. I wasn't expecting this. They would invite me into their homes for meals. They would tell me how much they love me and appreciate me. After six months, I ran down, I heard azan at Masjid Taqwa. And I ran down the street to Masjid Taqwa, and I stood there knocking on the door. I didn't know if I could go inside, because I knew Christians weren't permitted to go to Mecca or Medina. Maybe it's not a good idea for me to just walk into a mosque. 
So I stood there knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. And finally, Shafiq Zubir, who was the muezzin of the mosque, came to the door. And Shafiq said, may I help you? I said, yes, my name is Samuel. I'm a Christian from America. Is it okay to come inside? And again, Shafiq reached out. He hugged me, embraced me, pulled me to him. He said, come inside. Alan was Alan. I went inside. Now, I didn't know, understand what people were doing, standing, bowing, doing sajud, putting their face to the floor. I couldn't understand the Arabic at that time. Everything was new to me. So I just sat in the back in some chairs. And I would watch. Every day for three days when there was an azan, I went to the mosque. I was there five times a day for three days. And after the third day, I said to Shafi, Shafi, can you teach me to pray like a Muslim? I don't understand. And he began to teach me Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillahi rubil alameen, ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim, maliki, omidim, yakhan. My life changed. Now, I was just memorizing sounds, and I didn't understand what the sounds meant. But I would take these sounds back to me where I was staying. I'd pull out the Quran that we were working on in English, and I would read in English, Alhamdulillah, Rubil Alameen. I would see the English. I began to understand. Then I came, Ar-Rahman, Erohim. Oh, my God, my life. God, the most merciful, the one who can forgive all sins. My life was changed. I fell on my face crying before God. Oh, Lord, but you know what a horrible sinner I am. And I felt his love and forgiveness for me. A week later, I went to the Islamic, Islamic Education Foundation in Jeddah. And I um, said, Shahada. Dr. Sadiq Malki put me in his car and drove me directly to, Med to Mecca. And I said, Dr. Safi, uh, Dr. Sadiq, uh, there's only one thing. Please take me where I can see the Kaaba. I want to see the Kaaba because I knew the Kaaba was built by, refurbished and rebuilt by Ibrahim and Ismail. So we got to an opening, we're walking through 100,000 people, <laughs> squeezing back and forth, and I finally get to an opening, and I see the Kaaba. I fell on my face again, crying. Oh, God. The words of my mother going through my ears, Sami, Sami, when you're older, you have to pray to the God of Abraham. <laughs> There's only one God. So my mother's prayer was completed. Fulfilled. You see, even our Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he said, Jenna, or heaven, paradise, it's at the feet of our mothers. It certainly was in my case. I've come a long way since then. We founded Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. We're in the process, process of moving. moving how, long back ago, to, how long ago did you revert to Islam? That was in uh, June. 2012. I did Hajj in the following year. It's 10 years ago, alhamdulillah. Yeah. And uh, what has been your experience within your new faith community since then to now? Uh, you know, how, how, did, uh, how did they treat you? How, you know, what sort of well, experience you had? Everywhere I go in the world, I am so warmly treated by Muslims. Of course, they're very excited that a, a white American would come to Islam. Uh, they, I'm, uh, but there are many more. Let me say there are thousands of Americans who are coming to Islam. You see, I would say there are 80 million Americans who were taught what I was taught when I was a child. They were taught to pray to the God of Ibrahim there's only one God. Now, uh, but they don't understand what is Islam. 
It says clearly in the Quran, there are amongst the Christians and the Jews, there are those who are Muslim, those who submit to the God of Abraham. My mother was one, and there are many others, but they don't understand what is the Quran, they don't understand who is Prophet Muhammad. <laughs> so Muslims we've got to well, find these people. We there have are many Muslims them. as well who are in a similar situation because of language barriers or they don't have the... You know, they haven't sought the knowledge um, or the opportunity to gain that knowledge is not there. But in terms of the, your new faith community, uh, from your experience over the past 10 years, that the image that I said at the beginning of, of being, uh, you know, a negative image, has that been that impression as well now that you're within the community? Is that a deserving image? Well, I, I'm in Washington, D.C. right now. I drive a car. It says Muslim Voice for Peace in big letters on the side of the car. <laughs> and uh, I'm well received everywhere. Nobody here in America is threatening me. But let me say there are some people from my past, because I attended very evangelical fundamentalist Christian schools, and they don't understand. They look at me as having departed from the faith. I'm a traitor to Jesus Christ. So how do you address that in, in that circle of, of uh, you know, well, concern, that, that form of camaraderie that you had with them? How, how do you address that? And do you, are you still mm -hmm. able to maintain some of those con connections? Yes, yes. This, this is, is beautiful. beautiful. The fundamentalist Christian school I went to in Greenville, South Carolina, Bob Jones Academy, a uh, year before last, they arranged uh, a dinner for me at a nice restaurant outside the, the high school and they asked me to to share my testimony they listened very attentively um we have some people now who are actually saying shahada following me and but others they stand off at a distance they're waiting to see but i assure them you know I haven't betrayed Jesus Christ. I love Jesus, the Christ and Messiah of God, more today than at ever time in my life. The Quran teaches me to do this. And they say, but it's not the same Jesus. The Muslims worship a different Jesus. Brothers, <laughs> listen to me. He was worship born of the Jesus. Virgin Mary. Mm. He was, did many miracles, including raising Lazarus back from the dead to life again. He healed the blind. He healed the sick. He did miracles, miracles, and miracles. And um, it's just, and he ascended to God in heaven. And this same Jesus, the same virgin-born Jesus, is soon coming back. We see all the signs about us today. <clears throat> He's coming again. Muslims are expecting him to return. And they're surprised to hear this. They can't understand. This is what the Quran teaches. This is what the Hadith teaches. So I'm very excited to be able to go to them and share to them my love for Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who's spoken about in the Quran and in the Hadith. And, and, and again, one of the elements of separation or distinction is that uh, we are very clear that he is a messenger of God, beloved messenger of God. Uh, and, uh, but he's not God. You know, we yes. don't worship him as Muslims, but we love and honor and respect him. And, and we know about his mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and his return, inshallah. Uh, I speak to groups of Christians and Jews sometimes up to 100, 150 people. <clears throat> I put on the back of the wall behind me the six pillars of faith in Islam. And I asked them, how many of you believe that there's only one God? And everybody raises their hands. And then I say, how many of you believe in angels? Everybody raises their hands. <laughs> how many of you believe in holy books like Torah, like Zabur, like Injil? Everybody raises their hand. I said, this is interesting. 
you're Christians and Jews. How many of you believe in prophets, messengers that God sent to specific groups of people at different times in history? Everybody raises their hand. And I say to them, how many of you believe that if God says something's going to happen, talking providence, how many of you believe that if God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen? Everybody raises their hand. And I, before that, I say, you know, how many of you believe that someday you're going to stand in front of God and he's going to judge you for all the good and bad things you've done in your life? Everybody, again, raises their hand. Now, uh, I say we've got a lot of differences. There are all kinds of different Jews. There are different groups of Jews. They believe different things. There are different groups of Christians. There are Orthodox. There's Catholic. There's Protestant. And of the Protestant, there are probably a thousand different kinds of Protestants. But... Um, and we all believe different things. But the basics, the fundamentals, the six pillars of faith, we all agree on. Now, we still have differences. Muslims don't believe in Trinity. Muslims don't believe that Jesus died on the cross. Muslims don't believe that Jesus was God. But we believe that he was indeed a prophet and a messenger from God. So there are these fundamental differences, but there is a lot that we agree to, and we need to concentrate on that and try to bring everyone together in these last days. I believe that Jesus, the Christ and Messiah of God, will soon return to earth. We see the signs all around us. It's prophesied in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the New Testament. It's prophesied in the Hadith, that Asa will return. And then he will explain to us all things that we don't understand. Definitely. Uh, Samuel, you have experienced faith um, in a multiplicity of contexts as a Christian and now as a Muslim. For you personally, have you observed any difference in your ability to connect to the divine uh, as a Muslim compared to your previous experiences? Absolutely. You know, there are many things I learned as a Christian. Hymns. Uh, I memorized the Zabur. The uh, many things I learned and I didn't understand as a Christian that I now understand as a Muslim. Some of them are very simple. For instance, uh, there's a place in the in the Gospels where it says, uh, you know, that when we stand before Allah, He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. <laughs> well, that didn't make a lot of sense to me. Anybody can knows the difference between a sheep and a goat can tell by looking. In America, they don't look, in Canada, they don't look alike at all. But when you go to Saudi Arabia, you can't tell the difference. Sheep and goats look alike. They make the same sound. But a true shepherd can tell the difference. Uh, I didn't know what a gatekeeper was. In the Zabur, Daoud is talking, David, and he's Prophet David, peace and blessings be upon him. He said, I'd rather be a gatekeeper in the house of God than to dwell in sin. Well, I never knew what a gatekeeper was. I, I go to Saudi Arabia, and every house in my part of Jeddah, they've got a gatekeeper. He lives in a little room next to the gate. And when the owner comes home and toots the horn, he runs out and opens the gate. It's amazing. There's so many things that have come alive to me living in the Middle East. I mean, but, the, home, uh, the home of all of the prophets uh, yeah. that, that, you know, the Abrahamic prophets foundation is Middle East. Yes. Uh, Samuel, then, we'll take a short break and, and get back uh, momentarily. Until then, viewers, peace out.
Welcome back, viewers. We are in a conversation with uh, Samuel Shopshaw, uh, a revert to Islam, and he's telling us such a beautiful and compelling story, alhamdulillah. So, Samuel, you have been a Muslim now for 10 years, and you have uh, experienced uh, the Muslim communities in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. Uh, you know, there seems to be amongst our young people uh, especially given the kind of weight we have in terms of the negative imagery about our faith and the materialistic pull and so on. A lot of them uh, define it often very difficult to saddle with faith. Uh, you know, because, and a lot of them are compelled by, you know, you only live once, YOLO. What advice would you offer our, our Muslim youth of today uh, so that they can really experience the true beauty of faith, despite all of the, the political and social and economic, uh, you know, uh, hardships um, across the globe. Let me say there are two issues. One, oh, we know that Shaitan said to Allah that uh, he swore that he would be our enemy. He's the enemy of Allah. And he swore he would take us all into hell with him. All that didn't truly believe. Now, this is um, something that Muslim youth today need to understand. Number one enemy, shaitan. How can he pull us off the straight path? He has many devices, very powerful temptation. Um, Today, we live in a world where wrong seems right. And even our governments here in the United States, the United Nations and elsewhere are approving of sin, which is discouraged and forbidden in the Quran. And Muslim youth, let's face it, they want to be like everyone else. They don't want to, they want to go with the flow. I was in Oslo, Norway a few months, uh, a year, over a year ago. And in Oslo, I was speaking at the Oslo Islamic Center. And a young and I told the Imam Farouk, I said, I need to go for a walk. I need some fresh air. So I went to the front door, turned to the left, and walked down the street. As I walked down the street in Oslo, I see a young man leaning against the wall. I got closer to him, and his eyes were all blurry. He had needle tracks going up and down his arm. And I could tell he had been injecting heroin. He's a drug addict. And I said, young man, it's, it looks like you need help. And he started crying, please help me, help me, help me. I prayed with him. And I said, what's your name? He said, my name is Mohammed. Our Muslim youth are in trouble today. And everywhere I go, whether it's Toronto, Mississauga, or Detroit, Chicago, Los Angeles, Houston, everywhere I go, young people coming to me, where can I get help for drugs and alcohol? <laughs> I need help. Then I go to the Imam of their mosque and I say, do you have Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous? Is there a place where a young person can come and say, I'm an addict, I need, I need help. And the imams say, not in the mosque. So where are they going? They're going to a church down the street to get help. Or they're going to a secular health department to get help. Our mosque must be sinners for people to come and say, this is the problem in my life, help me. And we must be able, as Muslims, to reach out and help them. You know, a lot of the problem, whether it's in Germany, other, other countries I go to, a lot of the problems that Muslim youth today are ashamed to identify publicly as Muslim, when they should be very proud all the issues that the world is dealing with today, our prophet dealt with. Our prophet was a human rights activist. 
Human rights is a big issue today. He was a human rights activist. We can be very proud of that. The Medina Declaration. He said, everybody in Medina is equal, be treated equally. Just don't fight one another. He was a civil rights activist. His last message, a white's not above a black, a black's not above a white. All races are equal. He was a women's rights activist, you know, during his day. There was infanticide and female children were th thrown into the desert to die. He stopped it. No. And he gave women the right to, uh, to, uh, to have property, to have possessions, to run out their own businesses. He, he was, was an, an animal, animal rights activist. Right. It's, it's amazing. amazing. Animal rights right. activist. We know about his love for camels, for, for any animal, to treat them justly. He believed in protecting the environment. You cannot destroy crops and animals. It's in the Quran. It's throughout the Hadith. If you're in a war, you cannot destroy religious buildings, even if it's of another faith. They have to be protected, all religious buildings. I took a group of young people with me to Hiroshima, Japan. We were in the middle of Hiroshima where the Americans, where we Americans dropped the first atomic bomb. 130,000 people killed. All crops and animals destroyed. Everything, even churches, mosque, religious buildings, all destroyed. Um, atomic weapons, nuclear weapons should be outlawed in the world today. And we, we bowed and prayed at ground zero for the bombing of Hiroshima, for an end of nuclear weapons, and that God would raise up Muslim young people to fight that battle, to struggle to the end, to end Muslim, uh, this distribution of weapons of mass destruction. It's an Islamic thing to do. So, our young people can be very proud today. Our prophet was right on 14, 1,400 years ago. And we need to be doing the same thing today. You, you raised a very interesting point with regards to uh, the masjids not catering for quote-unquote uh, sinners or, or people who have fallen off uh, the straight path. Um, you find that in these centers, it's a place of judgment. It's not a judgment-free zone. And yep. uh, to me, that's one of the major obstacles. What, what is your observation on this issue? Why, why this lack of uh, social, um, you know, looking after the sinners, so to speak? Well, you know, I had so much sin in my life before I, as a Christian, when I was involved in politics, I was drinking, secretly doing drugs every now and then. All the Democrats and Republicans, they were all doing it. When I was with them, I start drinking. I don't blame it on them. It was this man who picked the glass up and swallowed the alcohol. And then when you're drunk or you're on drugs, that leads to other types of sin, horrible sin. But God, in his mercy, rescued me and forced me to go to Saudi Arabia, where I found and understood God as Arachman Erohim. After I confessed all my sins and Shafiq, the Muadan at that mosque, he said, wow. He said, do you understand what happened? I said, no. I said, I know I'm forgiven. He says, not only are you forgiven, but all the bad things, <laughs> all the bad things you've ever done have been turned into righteous deeds. And then I thought, my, 
I'm the richest man in all the world. I'm, I'm so, so grateful, grateful to God for taking me to Saudi Arabia, for bringing me into Islam and helping me to understand Quran. I'm so happy now to be able to preach to Muslim youth around the world and to bring them back to the straight path. We have two forms of da'wah, one to non-believers, to bring them to Islam, to help explain to them Islam, and thousands of them have said shahada. But also we have another da'wah program for Muslims to bring them to Islam, back to the straight path. So pray for us as we do this work. Our work also here at um, in Washington, D.C., just uh, as, as I was, I was doing, doing Christian, Christian Solidarity International, we're now doing with Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation, working with congressmen, working with senators, eventually with the Canadian Parliament and British Parliament, and helping them to intervene on behalf of persecuted Muslims around the world. What, what are some of your objectives in this Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation? Uh, one, to help people understand truly what is Islam and help them to understand that our prophet was right in line. He was human rights, civil rights, uh, women's rights. He was animal rights. He was protector of the environment, plants, uh, the earth. He, he, was, he cared about creation and he cared if he were here today, he'd be preaching against nuclear weapons. Absolutely. Because they destroy everything. And um, we want people to understand that. The second thing is that we're, Muslims are being persecuted in the world today. You know, there are 60 million, over 60 million refugees in the world today. And 95% of them are Muslim. They're running out of uh, we have the Rohingya problem, Myanmar. We have problems with uh, Muslims having walked all the way from Syria to Germany. Many of them are in Germany now. We have other refugee populations in Africa, Muslims. Now we have famines and pestilence coming, and Muslims are suffering terribly. We have a responsibility to make life easier for our Muslim brothers and sisters, wherever they are. And that's one of the main purposes of Muslim Voice for Peace. Do you think, uh, you know, being in Washington, D.C. Uh, can help that in any way? I mean, the American uh, political uh, infrastructure is one which um, does not necessarily empathize with uh, with Muslim um, as a faith group uh, as they do with uh, uh, other faith groups. Um, you know, since uh, you know, like you had the, your current president uh, <laughs> land in uh, Israel and say, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a total Zionist, and we have Palestinians who have been suffering for you know 80 years in Palestine being. Uh, being, you know, denied basic, basic human dignity. No, they're living in, on the West Bank of in Palestine now. Muslims, their crops are being destroyed. Their water is being taken over by illegal settlers. And many of the Muslims are now resorting to living in caves. How did it come to this? We have a responsibility to appeal to the United Nations and to work on behalf of our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Uh, I've been to Palestine twice in the last three years, and I've taken my assistant with me, Asa Haj Hussein. We've prayed at Al-Aqsa, we've lectured at Al-Aqsa Mosque. We've, um, let me, did you, more than 300 Jews have said Shahada in the last three years, 300 Jews have come to Islam. This is a growing movement. We need to assist them. Many of them are being left without a place to live. They're being disowned by their families. We need to assure them that we love them, that we care for them.
We also have uh, the Uyghur situation in China. We have Yemen. No. Uh, there is, a, you know, an explosion of a social movement in in, in Iran. Uh, there is so many, uh, you know, Pakistan has just been flooded, uh, you know, over so many percentage of land. I think it's like almost two thirds of it was was flooded. Uh, yeah. Nigeria has so much uh, issues in terms of flooding and, and, and people being internally displaced. Um, you know, it's it's quite a huge problem. Again, how does being in Washington, D.C. Uh, help you to bring this message to those who can make decisions about the world today? Look at Iraq. Iraq was totally destroyed using American cruise missiles and rockets. And I'm saying to the American Congress, if you think you had a right to go there, if you think that you needed to be there to protect, then you also have an obligation to go back and rebuild. I've been in schools in Mosul and Beji that are totally destroyed and still lying in ruins. When are we going to rebuild these schools? It's not an obligation. Uh, if, if we're going to destroy, we need, we're obligated to rebuild, to go back to Iraq. The same in Afghanistan and other countries. I hope to go to Afghanistan soon. Um, we'll find people there to work with to try to help rebuild the country and to produce a just Islam inside, inside Afghanistan. No, I'm 74 years old. <laughs> I ask you, where do you get the energy? Well, I'm getting tired. Asa al Haj Hussein, he's like my son. He's the vice president of Muslim Voice for Peace. He travels with me. He helps me get around. I'm very grateful to God. He's a, Asa is a great gift from God to me. And um, pray for us. Uh, we're trying to move everything from Saudi Arabia to 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 Washington DC he's still Asa's back in Saudi Arabia right now he'll come here next month and then I'll go to Saudi Arabia for a couple of months what we're trying to do is raise funding to support ourselves here in the United States um, let me say that it's been very difficult in the beginning a Muslim voice for peace business people in Saudi Arabia were handing us money and supporting our work. Asa and I traveled to more than, we were in 53 countries together, speaking with Christians and Jews and working with Muslim groups all over the world. But now it's illegal for anyone in Saudi Arabia to support any kind of work that's being done outside the country. So that money dried up. Now we're in the United States. <laughs> And we're going to mosque here and we're asking for help. And people are in their mindset, you know. One, the mosque here in the United States and in Canada are having a very difficult time because of the pandemic still and because of the economic situation. They don't have money to give. And we're here trying to figure out how to support the work that we're doing on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Pray for us. And I would say if there's anyone out there who can help us, go to our website, mvpr.org, mvpr.org. There's a donate button at the top. Click on it and follow the instructions. Uh, but we were in critical need of being able to support the work that we're trying to do here in Washington. In essentially to change the mindset of those uh, people in Washington uh, who make decisions affecting, uh, you know, Muslims and people of other faiths as well. Yes. Yes. It's very important to have a voice here. Asa and his brother Taj, where there's a Muslim day every year in at the U.S. Congress. Asa and his brother Taj were there this past year. I was in Saudi Arabia at the time. They did a wonderful job there. And we need to continue visiting individual congressmen on Capitol Hill. Uh, 
letting them ask us questions, being their friends. And soon we hope to have our own building inside Washington, D.C. and be able to live in Washington. Right now we're living in a temporary facility at a mosque here in, nor in Northern Virginia, which for which we're very grateful. But at the same time, it's it's a somewhat difficult situation. So pray for us. Uh, we're very grateful to the mosque here for its help. But we need to be on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Samuel, um, I hope God gives you with a long life and good health. And may he protect and preserve you and give you openings uh, to to do the fantastic work that you have set out to do. Uh, because you have a way of, of telling a story and, and, and giving a narrative in a very compelling and, and, and beautiful way, mashallah. And uh, may God bless you in all these efforts. We, we thank, thank you, you brother, brother for, and all our Canadian brothers and sisters for the great work that you're doing there. I hope to be back in Mississauga in the near future. I enjoy coming there in Toronto and Brampton and other places. May God bless you and encourage you. May he watch over us all. And may we be faithful in serving him no matter what the cost. Amin. Amin. Thank you very much, Samuel. Until uh, we meet again, peace out. Not in my name.